joining in it. So all the members of Christ's body, we all individually have our function to work together as a whole. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. So everyone in the world who is in Christ, that is in the spirit, they're baptized into one body. And all were made to drink of the same spirit. Think about that idea of baptism. Now, this isn't in the Bible, but the Didache, which was an early church manual written even before some of the books of the Bible were written, their instructions were that, if possible, baptize someone in running water. They use the word living water. You see how that relates to Jesus as the living water? And so to be submerged into baptism was that symbol that you were, in a, you were dying to self, you were raising to Christ, but you were being transported to a new environment. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have been completely submerged in the spiritual environment of God. You now have new eyes to see, a new mind that can understand and obey, a new heart that has different loves and desires. We're all baptized into one body. Let's look at verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in one body, each of them as he chose. The church body, just like our human body, is made up of diverse different members. You can see all the different body parts. It's it's very fascinating when you see all the different names of all the hundreds of bones that we have, all the names of our external shell of our body, all the different layers of muscles. And we know what it's like when one of those members is out of whack. When your back hurts and you walk a different way, when now you're throwing other things out of whack. And, or maybe it's your hand. Maybe you've broken your hand before and you've had to write with your opposite hand and you know what a struggle that is. When one part of our body is in pain or it suffers, it affects all of us. I was at, uh, I think it was PetSmart the one day, or maybe it was when Lifeway was around. It was that parking lot. And I remember getting out of my car and I closed the car door and it smacked my knee really hard and I fell on the ground and laid there for a little bit and then I got back in my car and just sat there because it just hurt so much. Like that, it was ridiculous because I did that to myself. Like, why, how, how does that happen? But it hurt. It affected my whole body, just hurting my knee. Maybe you know what that's like when you've gone to the kitchen to get a drink and your pinky toe stubs off of the coffee table. Well, that, that, uh, that sets you down for a little bit. I mean, that's just a little tiny toe, but it takes you out of commission. The body is important because of our various members having its own unique function. And it says that God arranged the members of the body, that he, he placed them, he laid them, he established them as he chose, as he desired, as he willed, and according to his intent. Again, it's a reminder of the sovereignty of God over our lives. So he's designed us. We should not merely be content with our spiritual gifts, but we should be humbly excited that God has included us in his body and gifted us to serve him. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. If we were all just a giant ear, how weird would that look? You couldn't see anything. You couldn't say anything. You couldn't sit down. You're just an ear. All of our body parts have a function. But God arranged them. There is diversity inside of unity. There is an estimated that there's 2 billion Christians in the world today. That might be true, that might not be. It's hard to get those numbers right because some people claim Christ, but they're actually far from Christ. But if we have that many people who are claiming Christ, that is a lot of diversity inside of God's unified body. We're like a puzzle. Have you guys ever put together a puzzle only to find out that a puzzle piece is missing? You might have 499 pieces together, but that one missing piece outweighs all of what you've done. 
It overshadows all of what has been completed because it's missing. It's a big gaping hole in the midst of all the completeness. And when you are in Christ's body, but you're not exercising your gift, you are a missing puzzle piece in God's local church body. Now, there might be seasons where you don't utilize your gifts as much as others. We all go through different seasons in life where we can be more active and less active in God's church. Just like right now, you're sitting, you're utilizing your rear end the most right now and your mind. You're not using your legs, you're not using your arms as much, but there will come a time when the sermon will end and you will stand up and you will utilize your legs again. We might go through seasons, but every part of God's body has a purpose and a use. Now, verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again of the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable gifts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to that which lacked it, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Did you catch that word in there that God composed, that God mixed together, right? It's, it's the idea of things being mixed together to create a superior compound. Uh, the the uh, one uh, writer said, the, the word pictures God as a craftsman, structuring the church intentionally and carefully and mixing the gifts and personalities of the believers like a metallurgist mixes metals to give strength to the final product. Just like a musical composition has many different parts, all of them are written for a specific reason to come together to make that great symphony. My my younger brother, he's he's a really talented musician. He was at Barber Ingram, and he was a great percussionist. He was a great saxophone player, and he had taught himself the piano. And I remember one concert, he was up on stage for one of the songs as a percussionist, and they'd given him two blocks of wood. And at a certain time, he smacked the blocks of wood together. And I joked with him afterwards. I said, dude, I could have done that. You know, you're just hitting two by fours together. But that was a specific part written for a specific song to add that type of percussion to that symphony. And so you are a certain type of instrument. You might be the saxophone going off on a solo, or you might be the two blocks of two by fours being smacked together. No matter what it is, it's all coming together for the whole thing that was intended. So let there not be any division in the body. To divide is, the idea is like when, when the, the Jews would rend their garments, right? When someone passed away or when something was uh, at a hard time and they would rip their garments violently and shred it. That's the idea of a division in a church. We've all seen that where churches differ over secondary and tertiary doctrines and it rips the church apart. We are not to divide but to be unified. John 13, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Our mark of mutual love to each other is a sign to the world that we are true disciples of Jesus. So let's care for one another. We aren't to be divided, but we are to care for one another. Now this word to care, it it was very interesting to me because I noticed some wordplay going on. We aren't to be divided from each other, but to care for one another is to divide yourself out amongst the church body. We don't divide from the church body, we divide ourselves for the church body. Do you understand that? That your gifts, you are to work them out in the ways that God has shown you to edify, encourage each other, build each other up. And so we don't divide from each other, we divide ourselves for each other. But if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. We should have that symphony and that re- or, uh, sympathy and that rejoicing with and for each other. Paul writes in Romans, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We are not going through life alone. There are no lone rangers in God's army. We are all in this together. You should not weep alone. You should not rejoice alone, but do those things with the body of Christ. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So this illustration of the, of the body, right? You're, you, you are the body. You as a church are the body, and individually you are a member of the body. 
And God has appointed the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. God has appointed, again, God's sovereignty, God's sovereign choice in our spiritual gifts. It's not us deciding that, oh, I think I like the spiritual gift of discernment. Maybe I'll be discerning spirits. No, that, that doesn't happen. It is given to you by God as the spirit wills and God chooses. And then he gives us a list. Some of these, it's a review of what he's already said. But he gives us kind of hierarchy here amongst the gifts. First, the apostles, right? Those who were taught directly by Jesus. We have the 12 main apostles. We, we might call them the capital A apostles. But then we see other apostles that Paul writes about and Luke writes about. Like Barnabas, he was an apostle. Uh, Paul will write to greet certain apostles, and they aren't ones of the 12 disciples that became apostles. So it was people who had learned directly from Jesus Christ as he was manifested in the flesh. Those are apostles, and they're all gone this, to this day. So the apostles pioneered the path as missionaries to spread God's word. Second were the prophets, those who were the inspired spokesmen of God, who spoke new revelation from God in the churches, while the letters were being written, while the gospels were being assembled, and now that we have the full canon of scripture, we have the complete word of God, there's not a need for those prophets. Now these two roles, they were given the top billing because they were limited edition. Some people, they really like different things like, like shoes, sneaker heads. The, the shoes are more valuable if they're more rare. If Nike's only made 50 of a certain type of shoe worldwide, you can guarantee that that price can be up in the thousands. And people will pay for it because it is rare. The apostles and the prophets are given that top billing because they were rare. Third are teachers. It's those who could apply the teaching of the apostles and the prophecies of the prophets. Then there are miracles, healings, helping, administrating, and tongues. And it's funny that these gifts that were mentioned as the lower gifts were sought out the most. And we have to understand that we might have some experiences with these gifts or thinking that these gifts are, some of them still around, but we can't let our experiences interpret the Bible for us. For example, I, I used to go to Mexico quite a bit on, uh, between Christmas and New Year's. Had about a three-year span where I went and a summer where I went. And there were a lot of awesome things to see God do. Now, I remember one trip specifically, I, I was praying to God that I, I'd like to see a miracle. I, I've heard the stories about it when I'm on these trips of the different miracles that happen. I would like to see one. Well, we would do street VBS. And the one day, we pull up to a random parking lot. We'd go around to the houses nearby and invite people to come, and that we had a free gift to give them, and the free gift was the gospel of Jesus. So people come, and one guy comes down the street in a wheelchair. He's, he's being helped along by somebody, and his story was that he had gotten hit by a bus when he was younger and was unable to walk. Well, the, one of the leaders that was there, he said that he had prayed over someone the day before, and he felt their bones shift back into place. I thought, okay, well, I've not seen that, so I can't verify if that happened or not. But this guy and pretty much the rest of our team, which was about 20 to 25 people, gather around this man and pray for him. And he stands up out of his wheelchair, and he begins to walk while holding on to another guy. Now, does that mean that the gift of healing is still exercised to this day? Was the healing because of the people praying? Well, that wasn't an instantaneous full healing of this man's body. But I do believe, and I do believe that we have scripture. James tells us to pray for healing for others. We've seen that in our own church where people have been healed from diseases and cancers and things like that. That God still heals because he can still do miracles, but that us as people, we are no longer the vessels for such thing. Another experience I had, which I interpreted wrongly at the time, when we would go to Mexico, you'd usually have an, an interpreter in your group to help interpret Spanish, so you could talk in English, they would interpret it in Spanish, and we'd be able to talk. Well, this, this one year that we went, they, the group, they couldn't find enough translators. So our 25-person team was just one team out in about 150, 200 people. So I had taken Spanish in college, remembered hardly none of it. I could say, you know, Jesus Christos is mi salvor, and uh, pecado es muerto, right? Sin is death. Like, I, I could give, a, like, a three-sentence gospel message, but that was it. And they said, oh, well, you're a translator then. So it was me and a girl that was in high school taking her first Spanish class, 
that we went out with our group as translators. Now, what was weird was we could speak in English, and we'd have uh, someone speaking back to us in Spanish, and there was an understanding that we'd walk away, all of us, with tears in our eyes. And it's like, well, how do we have some sort of mutual understanding of what was going on here? How were we able to speak more Spanish than what we knew? And at the time, I thought, well, I guess that's my experience with speaking in tongues. But I can't define the Bible by my experience. Right? The, the Bible defines our experience. And maybe we just had an emotional connection at some of those times. Maybe God was bringing to mind the things that we had learned in our classes at that time. Because as we see, the gift of tongues was not a language that you knew. And I had somewhat of an understanding of Spanish. I think too many times we have these experiences, and so we interpret the Bible by our experience instead of interpreting the Bible by the Bible. You see, the Bible explains itself. We can use outside sources like our experiences and teachers of the Bible, uh, commentaries and Bible studies, but the Bible will explain itself through the Bible. And so we must understand that these gifts that are given, they're given by God for a purpose. And for some of these gifts, the purpose was that laying of the foundation of the church. Now, he lists off two uh, gifts here that weren't mentioned before. The gift of helps. That's someone who's just ready and they're just willing to help. They might not have the vision for something. They might not have the plans for something, but they come alongside of you because you have the vision. You have the plans. Or maybe you're the helper. that You, you just want to faithfully serve God wherever and whenever you can. And then the gift of administration. This is the person who's leading. They're, they're literally steering the ship of the church. They're, they're the ones who give direction for, here's what we're doing. Here's where we're going. Let's, let's pray and see if this plan is of God. And then they rally those with helps to execute that vision. Paul ends this with some rhetorical questions. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? And the obvious answer is 